Welcome to Amazing Grace Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Luca Taliano. We've been walking through a series called Son of God, Son of Power. We're seeing that Jesus is powerful. And today we're going to see that he has power even over nature. We begin in the name of the Father, the name. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is powerful. But so often, we don't ask him to help. Well, why not? It's because we think we don't need him. Or sometimes we're scared that what he's willing to do isn't for our good. We're convinced that maybe God isn't out for our good. We call him a liar when he says that he loves us. In other words, we sin. We silently confess our sins, whether it's this sin or another sin that has brought us guilt this week. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's removed your guilt forever. You are his own precious child. He does what is best for you every time, all the time, even when we don't understand it and even when we fail to trust. He has forgiven us fully. Now may God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, in mercy receive the prayers of your people. Grant them the wisdom to know the things that please you and the grace and power always to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In our first lesson today, we hear God saying, hey, I created nature and I'm in control. Our first lesson is from Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or what were its footings set? Or, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. This is God's word. We're going to continue with our psalm of the day, this ancient song. We don't have the music for it anymore, but we still have the lyrics. I invite you to join with me in speaking responsibly the words of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. In our second lesson, we hear once again, God created everything. He's got power. The second lesson is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. This is God's word. Every Christian on the planet confesses the truths that are part of the Apostles' Creed. Even if they don't know the Apostles' Creed, if you're Christian, you say, yeah, this is what I believe. And so we get to join a group of Christians, every Christian in the world, as we speak now a summary of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So the part of God's word that we're going to be focusing on today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 4. That day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is God's word. So here in the Bible, in our translation, it says, Jesus asked his disciples, why are you so afraid? The original Greek actually has it a lot harsher than that. In the original, if you were to translate really literally, it would say, Jesus asked them, why are you cowards? How bad do you have to be for Jesus to call you a coward? That's really harsh, isn't it? Last week, we saw how Jesus healed a man with a fatal disease named leprosy. And Jesus had told this man to go and have a party in Jerusalem, which was part of what God had set up if anyone was ever healed of leprosy. And we heard that that man didn't listen to Jesus, but went out and told everyone what Jesus had done. And because that person disobeyed Jesus, it caused hardship for Jesus. See, his popularity soared, and now Jesus couldn't go into towns anymore. It was too crowded. He couldn't teach. He, he couldn't do what he was there to do. And so he had to stay out in the desert, in the wilderness, in deserted places. And even there, people showed up. And what happens today is in the direct aftermath of that event. Jesus was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. That's uh, a lake in Israel. And Jesus was teaching. And there were so many people crowding around him, he couldn't even teach them on the shore. He had to hop in a boat, put out a little bit, and teach them from the boat. Now, the weather at the Sea of Galilee is tropical. It is hot and it is humid. 
and he's sitting on a boat in the water. Now, those of you who like fishing and particularly fishing from boat, what happens if you are fishing all day in the hot sun? Get a little tired? That's what, that's what I've seen, that's been my experience. And that's what happened here. Jesus is teaching all day in the boat and the sunset hits, he's, he's tired. He dismisses the crowd. He says, I'm done for the day. And he tells his disciples, okay, guys, let's just sail across to the other side. And as the disciples are getting ready, they're seasoned fishermen. Many of them, they know how to handle a boat. They lower the sail so they're all ready to go. Jesus grabs a pillow. He sits down in the back of the boat and he is out. He is sleeping. He is just so tired. And the disciples set out and they start sailing for the other side of the lake. Gives Jesus a good chance to rest. Now, the Sea of Galilee, you can go there today. It's still like this. It's kind of like a bowl. And the ocean, uh, the, the ocean, the lake is down at the bottom. And there it's tropical. It's hot and humid. But the sides of this bowl reach up so high into the mountains that it's cold and dry up here. And what happens then is that there's this this circular motion of wind, and it can get really violent really fast. And that's what happened. This windstorm comes out of nowhere. And once again, these are seasoned sailors. They know how to handle a windstorm, but this particular storm is particularly violent. So the disciples are trying to control the boat. The, they're, they're lifting up, they're furling the sails so that they don't get pushed violently across the ocean. The water is coming over the side. And it's so bad that these seasoned fishermen are convinced that they're going to die. That they're going to be swept overboard and no one will ever find the body because it's just going to be gone. Or, or that the boat is going to sink or capsize. They are scared for their lives. They're panicking. And they turn around and Jesus is still sleeping. Have you ever been in a position where you were panicked, where you were scared out of your mind, you were convinced that something terrible is about to happen, and someone else in that same situation is just nice and calm? Don't you get angry at them? Come on, aren't you paying attention? Don't you care? And that is exactly what the disciples say. They go back to Jesus, they wake him up, and they say, don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus gets up, and it says that he rebuked the wind and the waves. Now, a rebuke is a command with an implied threat. Anyone who has kids knows what that is. If I say to my kids, go to bed, I'm giving them a command. But there is an implied threat there, right? If you don't go to bed, something bad is going to happen. Now, I can do that with my kids. But if there's a thunderstorm and I walk outside and I look up at the storm and I go, stop it. You would think I was nuts. I can't control the wind. I can't control the weather. Now, we do know there's a story of the Roman emperor Caligula who went to war with the ocean. He commanded his army to go to the shore and actually hit the waves with their swords. But Caligula was not exactly known for being on the level. He was a little nuts, or a lot nuts. But here is Jesus, and he looks at the wind and the waves, and he looks up at them, and he says, stop it. Be quiet. But the wind listens. It just stops. And the waves... You know, when water is disturbed, it keeps on going for a while, but the waves just, just, they just stop. And before you had to shout to be able to hear each other. And now the only sound is the water dripping from the disciples' beards. And Jesus looks at them and he says, why are you cowards? Don't you believe? Apparently, this is what it takes for Jesus to call someone a coward. To fear for your life when you're in a life-threatening situation. Now, hold that thought. We're, we're going to wrap up. 
uh, the, this account here, and then we'll come back to that thought. Jesus calls them cowards. And then he goes back to bed and he lies back down. He's just, he's out again. And in the original Greek, it says that the disciples feared a great fear. They were scared out of their minds. But why? Well, because the storm was going to kill them. And now here's Jesus who is sleeping. Who's more powerful than the storm? a lot of power. That's scary. Now, let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about what a coward is. I grew up learning that courage was something that you aspire to. It was something I was taught in He-Man and Thundercats. My heroes had courage. Now, maybe your heroes had courage growing up too. Maybe that was the Lone Ranger or John Wayne or Harry Potter, you know, Gryffindor was all about courage, right? But I also learned from one of my other heroes, the doctor from Doctor Who, who said, courage is not not having fear. Courage is having fear and doing what you need to do anyway. And, and I still aspire to that. I want to have that kind of courage. And to this day, calling someone a coward is, you know, those are fighting words, right? What are you? Chicken? To call someone a scaredy cat, that, that's not a good thing to call someone. But Jesus did. And I want you to understand that this isn't just calling someone names. When God calls someone a coward, that's a really, really dangerous thing. The book of Revelation talks about um, a lot of things, but chapter 21 talks about heaven, except for one verse. There's one verse in chapter 21 that talks about hell, and this is what it says. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be the fiery lake of burning sulfur, this is the second death. Catch that? That cowards, murderers, liars, these are the people that go to hell. And that is terrifying to me. Because there's a lot that scares me. I grew up in a mobile home park. I lived in a mobile home for 15 years of my life. And... Mobile homes are not exactly known for being good, sturdy construction. I also grew up in North Dakota where there were a fair amount of tornadoes. And when that tornado siren went off, I learned to be scared because there was no protection. I would have to hop in the car with my parents and we'd drive to the nearest place that had a public basement. It was a mall a couple miles away. And for that time, it's scary. Tornado hit. That's it. And, and I've carried that fear with me into my adulthood. I still get scared when I hear tornado siren go off. Now, I suspect that for you, there's something that scares you. Maybe it's not tornadoes. Maybe you laugh at that. But for you, maybe it's cancer. Or maybe it's seeing someone you love hurt. Or maybe it's the future. Or maybe it's someone you love finding out the truth about who you really are. These things scare you. And then I read that verse from Revelation where it says that the cowardly get sent to hell. And that's it's terrifying. Why would God hate cowards so much that he would send them to hell? It's because if you're a coward, it's because you do not trust God. I've read that in the Bible, God says, do not be afraid or some form of it 365 times. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, why not? God says to you, I have this. I've got you. 
and we hear that promise. We hear, don't be afraid. And we go, yeah, God, you know what? I'm going to be afraid anyways. <clears throat> well, why are we afraid? Because so often we cannot imagine someone more powerful than ourselves. I'm scared because I cannot control the situation. I'm scared because I cannot control the future. I'm scared because I cannot control the weather. And God says, oh, don't worry, I got this. I hold the future in my hands. I control the weather. I, I've got this and I'll turn it all for your good. And I say as a Christian, oh, that's great, God. I'm glad you're in control, but I'm gonna freak out anyways. <laughs> in other words, when I am cowardly, it's because I am failing to trust God. I am failing to trust his promises and saying, God, you can make all the promises you want. I don't think you're really going to keep them. That's why I'm scared. And we don't often think about it that way, but that's what's going on spiritually. So what do we do? Did you notice in our reading that the disciples were scared? And Jesus rescued them anyway. Yeah, he called them cowards. But it's not like he said, come on, guys, it's just a storm. Chill out. Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. Quiet, be still. Because Jesus loved his disciples. And then he went back to bed. Jesus had real courage. I don't know if you ever think about it this way, but Jesus was the most courageous man who ever lived. All his life, he knew he was walking toward the cross. And he kept on walking. How much courage does it take to pray in a garden and be able to see from, from the city across the valley a mob with torches watching towards you, and you know that they're going to arrest you and take you to the cross, and you stand your ground and stay and let them arrest you. How much courage does that take? And yeah, Jesus prayed, if there's any other way, let's do that instead. But he still went, didn't he? And when Jesus went to the cross, he died for the cowardly. He died for you and for me. For every time that we said, God, I don't trust you because I don't think I, I have reason to be scared. Instead of punishing us, Jesus was punished in our place. Howard is gone. You are forgiven. But that's not the end of the story. Because Jesus didn't just take away your cowardice but he's given you his record of courage. So when God looks at you, he sees his courageous daughter, his courageous son. He loves you. And three days after Jesus died, he rose again. He's alive. The God who loves you so much that he stood his ground and died for you is alive. And he's reigning at the right hand of God, the father. And what that means is that he's controlling all of history for your good. Whether that's the weather or the cancer or your relationships. He'll turn it out for your good. He's powerful enough to do it and he loves you. How cool is that? That even though we have not stood our ground, we are forgiven. Jesus suffered the pains of hell in your place there is no condemnation for you now who are in Christ Jesus. So what do we do? How, how can we avoid cowardice in the future? I'm going to recommend that you memorize some verses from the Bible. And, and there's some great verses in the Psalms. Um, maybe you might memorize uh, a hymn. Uh, could be, a mighty fortress is our God. Great hymn for that. For me, one of my favorites is Psalm 27. It begins this way. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27. 
but memorize some of those. So the next time you're scared, the next time you face fear, stop and bring that verse to mind. Whatever it is that you, that you memorize and say, God's got this. This thing that I'm scared of, it's bigger than me. But God is bigger than that thing. He has promised to protect me. He has promised that whatever this thing is, he will turn it out for my good. God's going to keep his promises. And if you fall to fear again, go back to God and say, God, forgive me. I didn't trust you. But I know that you have forgiven me. Help me rejoice in that forgiveness more and more. You don't have to be afraid. Jesus stood his ground for you. And now you are his courageous son, his courageous daughter. Amen. Amen. Let's continue now by reviewing a part of the small catechism. Today we get to review a part from the Lord's Prayer. But deliver us from evil. What does this mean? In conclusion, we pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would deliver us from every evil that threatens body and soul, property and reputation. And finally, when our last hour comes, grant us a blessed end and graciously take us from this world of sorrow to himself in heaven. All right, time for our prayer of the church. If you have a prayer request, please either use the chat function in Zoom or you can text me if you prefer. Uh, the chat function is usually more reliable just because texting sometimes takes a little bit to get to me. Um, but uh, uh, send any prayer requests you've got. <laughs> um, we have a request for someone named Kelly, who is not a member of our congregation, a different Kelly. Um, her family is severely affected by COVID. Um, as I recall, um, it's two family members and one was on a ventilator, taken off the ventilator and then put back on the ventilator again. Um, so it's her aunt and grandfather, thank you. Um, so we're gonna be praying for Kelly and her family. We're gonna be praying for Emmett. Um, Emmett, was a, well, we prayed for him last week. He's five days old and had open heart surgery. They've closed his chest and taken him off many of the tubes and IVs yesterday. Great news. We're going to be praying for Emmett. Um, that is the grandson of a friend of one of our members. Make sure I haven't got any texts here. All right. I've not received any other prayer requests. We will pray here. And if any other prayer requests come in, I'll add them in as we're praying. Oh, aha. Um, Rodney Hamilton is the friend of one of our members. Rodney just had, uh, I don't remember if it was part of his foot or his whole foot amputated. Um, that's obviously a pretty serious thing. So we're gonna be praying for Rodney as well. Let's join in prayer. Lord, you are powerful. You control nature, even for our good. Forgive us for the times that we have run in fear and guide us to run to you, to have confidence in your power and your love because you used all of that power for us. Thank you for that. Help us join in rejoicing. In this world, there are many things that are so much bigger this, than us and so many things that are so easy to fear. We ask you to be with Kelly, her aunt and her grandfather as they, as they suffer through COVID and suffer through having loved ones with COVID. We ask if it's your will to send healing, but we ask for sure to send comfort. Send your people with your message of grace to hold them close to heart and to point them to you. We also pray thanksgiving for Emmett as his chest has been closed up, be with his family and love them dearly. Comfort them in this hard time and help them to rejoice in this step toward healing. We also pray for Rodney as he's, as he's lost his foot. Be with him 
that, that's scary when you lose a part of your own body like that. Comfort him. Again, we ask that you send your servants to be with him, to encourage him in this scary time. Lord, we pray all this in your name. Amen. I invite you to join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>